What we're going to start with is sort of the definition of flexion distraction injuries versus burst injuries. And John France did an absolutely wonderful job. John, I love that. Uh, I absolutely loved your talk. It was really, really good. But what I want to start with is a classic flexion distraction injury and a classic burst fracture. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to condense this talk over the next few minutes to uh, really simple, because I'm a really simple-minded person. Flexion distraction injuries, I treat posteriorly. True burst fractures, burst fractures with a neurologic deficit, I treat anteriorly. And we're going to talk about why that is, because you can do it. You can do a better decompression and you can do a true short segment fixation. So this flexion distraction injury, John showed quite nicely the importance uh, of this posterior column that is disrupted under tension, all right? And usually a true flexion distraction injury does not have a significant anterior column injury that fails under compression. It may have a uh, disco ligamentous injury where the disc fails under tension as well. You may have a little um, component, maybe a super end plate fracture as you see here, but uh, the anterior column is relatively intact. It, it is intact. And so this can be treated with a posterior operation and a short segment posterior operation because the anterior column is intact. And usually these injuries do not have a significant anterior compressive lesion from such, such as a burst component. So the neurologic deficit, if, if it is present, is because of the instability and again can be treated with a posterior operation short segment posterior operation if there is a significant burst component to this and this becomes a burst fracture and a burst fracture with posterior column disruption and again this becomes a a, a burst fracture with a a b type injury and we'll talk about that but because of the significant amount of uh, compression of the neural contents because of the uh, bony elements in the front of the canal. As we'll talk about, the best way to decompress this is from an anterior operation. Also in regards to stability, the, the best way to provide a short segment fixation is with an anterior operation. The problem with our posterior constructs is, and John showed this with, with that uh, last case, is that you need to do a long segment construct if you have significant disruption of the anterior column. So now we, we tend to do these operations in the back, but they have to be long segments. And so you wrap up normal motion segments, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And especially in the low lumbar region, most of these fractures are, are in the focal lumbar junction or upper lumbar region. And you have to go down lower into the lumbar uh, area. And that is a problem. That, that, that is a problem fusing normal segments. So that's why I would rather do these from an anterior, uh, an anterior approach. All right, so this is the typical flexion distraction injury um, and, and, and actually a ligamentous flexion distraction injury. John showed that sort of a nice sort of uh, true chance fracture that, that is, is actually through the bony context. But most of these, especially in adults, are disco ligamentous flexion distraction injuries that do not heal well. Uh, significant posterior column disruption, again, fails in tension. And because this is where the, the failure is, it's best if this is operated on from a posterior approach. And this can be done with a short segment construct. In fact, this could possibly even be done without even adding this uh, cephalad co component, just with a short segment posterior instrumentation. These are nicely uh, uh, fixed. On the other hand, burst fractures, and, and I'm, what I'm talking about is real burst fractures, right? Not the, the burst fracture with a, a neurologically normal patient and not significant posterior column uh, disruption, but real burst fractures with significant bone in the canal. We need to understand what our treatment goals are. And our treatment goals are number one, to maximize neurologic recovery. And that requires decompressing the spinal canal. And again, the best way to do that is with an anterior approach. You can try to mess around through a posterior or posterior lateral extracavitary approach, but you cannot get around the corner and take this bone out as well as you can do it from an anterior approach. The other issue is 
in regards to, to maximizing neurologic recovery, we need to think about what happens a decade or two down the road with post-traumatic stringomyelia. And I've seen many patients now, years and years after a posterior operation, where they, the patient was uh, neurologically devastated. So they did a posterior operation, did as, as good as they could to decompress the canal, but because of a, the, the uh, complete injury, did not completely decompress the canal. And a decade or two later, I see the patient with a worsening neurologic deficit because of the post-traumatic stringomyelia. And again, that is because of the disruption of the CSF flow from this anterior compressive bony component. And, and many times, with significant amount of bone in the canal, it does not resorb. With a less amount of bone in the canal, it, we can see resorption of this bone over time, but, but uh, with significant canal compromise, it does not resorb, and this can lead to further neurologic issues. Again, important to reduce and stabilize the spinal column, and this can be done nicely, again, with a short segment component from an anterior-only operation, which allows early mobilization uh, and allows them to get, uh, to get to rehab. So again, thinking about these the, these goals uh, is important. And again, the neurologic decompression, in my opinion, is the number one goal for these neurologically devastated patients. And again, this can be done with an anterior decompression or all sorts of posterior decompression, either direct with a laminectomy, costotransverse transverse uh, lateral extracavitary approach, transpedicular approach, or indirect. John showed a nice indirect de de decompression, but sometimes uh, these don't work very well. And without a doubt, the, the most reliable way to decompress a bony fragment in the anterior aspect of the spinal canal is with an anterior operation. Without a doubt, it, it is. And so as, as, as seen here with the significant burst component, significant bone in the, in the canal, you cannot, from a posterior, even a lateral extra, extra cavitary uh, approach, get around the corner and try to get this bony fragment out. It's dangerous. You're not as successful as if you do a true anterior operation, take the pedicle down, get above and below to normal spinal canal and be able to take this, these fragments out of the canal. And you can do it safely and most reliably with a true anterior op operation. Now, one of the issues is, oh, I'm having a John France problem here. Um, what about sta stabilization? And Jens brought up uh, the fact that uh, uh, McGuire and I worked uh, years ago on anterior uh, only operations. And what we found was that b back then the thought was, yes, you can do anterior operations, but if there was a posterior column disruption, a B fracture, you could not fix these with anterior only constructs. And what we found, we did a nice study looking at this and we found that yes, we could, even with B column, uh, with, with B type fractures, we were able to, uh, with an anterior only construct using a strut graft and anterior instrumentation, fix these quite nicely. I'm having uh, issues as well. Maybe you, Ashley, could you, uh, th there you go. So uh, we uh, did a, a study looking at B fractures, burst uh, burst fractures with B injuries, posterior column disruptions, and found out that with anterior-only constructs, we were able to stabilize these, had a high fusion rate, and uh, were able to do, do them with anterior-only procedures. So let's see if we can get this to move along. And what we found is allows a short segment construct, limit, limiting the the normal areas that you need to fuse, such as if you're gonna do it from a poster approach, John showed a very nice operation, but he uh, in, in involved uh, multiple segments that were normal uh, in, in, in the fusion mass. I will also show you, we, we did a study looking at sagittal uh, alignments and we were able to restore and keep the sagittal alignment better with an anterior only construct compared to a poster only construct. And we have a very, very high fusion rate with these anterior only procedures. Kirkwood also showed the same thing. He looked at uh, burst fractures anterior versus posterior uh, operations in a prospective randomized fashion and found that the anterior operations had fewer complications compared to the posterior operations. Sagittal alignment uh, was better with the anterior operation. We found the same thing as I'll show you. 
pain was less with anterior approaches. And posterior short segment constructs have a very, very high rate of failure. Multiple studies, going back to this, this one by Asher, uh, uh, showed that when we try to fix burst fracture, fractures, significant burst fracture components with posterior short segment constructs, we have a very, very difficult time. And what happens, it falls back in, in into, we, we can initially restore the sagittal alignment, but over time it fails. And so what we did, we, we did a, a study looking at short segment posterior operations versus anterior only operations for, for these burst fractures. And we used an Argison construct that is a short segment posterior fixation that adds one level with the hooks, hooks above. And these hooks are at the same level as, as the um, uh, lower pedicle screw. And so lo looking at uh, matched uh, uh, a patient's um, posterior short segment construct versus anterior only, what did we find? What we found that we were able to restore the sagittal alignment in both groups initially very, very well. But over time, what happened is that the posterior constructs, can you move my slide one more, please? Um, uh, what we found that, that, that over time, the posterior group lost a significant amount of sagittal alignment, whereas the anterior group did not lose that o over time. And so we had a statistically significant difference in the anterior only versus the posterior only constructs that favored the anterior sh short segment construct. And this has uh, uh, really changed my thinking or, or has, has, has uh, made me think about what is the best way to handle these burst fractures, these significant burst fractures. And if I can do it with one operation only and a short segment and do this from, from an anterior approach, that's the way I think that they, they should be done. So can you make me there there you go so so again significant burst fracture uh significant bone in the, in the canal and with a very very nice single stage anterior operation uh can you make that go forward one please thank you um provide a reduction of the uh uh kyphotic deformity and we know over time we have a very very high chance of keeping this sagittal alignment normal. And even if there is a, a significant uh, B-type component to, to this fracture, a posterior ligamentous uh, injury, our anterior constructs do quite well at keeping this uh, uh, stable. Can you, there, there we go. So in my opinion, indications for an anterior approach, uh, burst fracture, type A, or even a type B with posterior uh, ligamentous column injury, neural compression, uh, uh, due to retropulse fragments with or without a uh, neurologic deficit. Insufficient anterior column support due to the comminuted vertebral body, which would not allow a short segment posterior construct. This is a v these are very good indications for anterior only fixation. Can you uh, go for again, the contraindication in my opinion, though, is a fracture dislocation, a C type injury. These obviously are not amenable to answer only fixation. And in my opinion, requires a posterior operation first to do the realignment. And if there remains significant anterior um, uh, compression on, on, on the canal, on the spinal cord, then the secondary anterior operation. So thank you so much again, Jens. Uh, it, it has been, a, 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 again, a very, very fun time for me. And I uh, have learned an enormous amount I always do uh, for, for these, these courses. So thank you so much. And we thank you, Rick. Outstanding lecture, uh, multiple chats. Uh, I'll have to fire some rapid questions at you. I'll ask uh, Ashley to put the ARS question on TL burst fractures up for the audience. Anterior, posterior, or posterior anterior in any combination, all things being equal. So please vote whilst we're talking. <clears throat> By the way, in our next anatomy lab, which is coming right around the corner, we'll try to put into live action what Rick uh, just talked about. And I still wish that Rick and John were there to do this, but they obviously couldn't. Uh, due to our pandemic, but uh, we will have uh, uh, we will have Neil versus uh, Rod, so the battle will be Swedish versus Swedish. 
so this should be quite entertaining and informative to put into picture mode. And I'll ask both Rod and John and Zach uh, and obviously our other colleagues to uh, comment. So as we're seeing uh, this evolving, um, there's a, a strong race in advance uh, or in favor of posterior and anterior. At the same time. Zach, what are your thoughts on what uh, Rick said in reality? I mean, uh, anterior surgery sounds so cool. The concepts are great. Uh, okay. Let's discuss the reality on the ground. Osteoporosis, polytrauma, blood loss, and an anterior primary surgery, okay. access morbidity. What are your More life uh, responses you to Rick's uh, good yeah, thoughts good. in general? <laughs> I, I, Rick, I, I liked your talk and everything that you said resonated. I think, you know, from a practical standpoint, you know, I think our, our bias here is still probably doing more posterior, but exactly what you said and your concern for the motion segments, and, and that's real. And, uh, you know, I certainly think about that. And that should be probably a bigger part of the equation. Uh, I'm anxious to see, you know, how, how your results pan out. And maybe that, you know, we need to change our, our own approach here. But uh, it was nice. Um, so, uh, Ashraf, um, the other reality of posterior column fixation failures is this myth of ligamental taxes and burst fractures, which is a myth. Um, how, how can we avoid over-distraction? What do you teach uh, your residents and fellows in terms of avoiding over-distraction to not put too much burden on posterior equipment? Um, yeah, I mean, I do think you... Um, I, I don't think that ligamental taxis alone is going to reduce, you know, um, any compression within the canal. Uh, in terms of over-distraction, I mean, you have a reference point by the height of the lumbar vertebra or of the vertebra above and the vertebra below. Um, as sort of a rough estimate uh, for what your final uh, fractured uh, vertebral height should be. Um, and so that's what we aim for. Rick and uh, faculty, I don't know whether you can see the results of the poll, but uh, the 51% uh, supermajority was achieved for both to answer any combination. So, uh, Rick, I hate to tell you this, only 14% were, were for anterior only. Uh, tell us from your perspective, how much, uh, let's say, a polytrauma influences your decision making? Another question from Stefan from Germany was uh, the age old question of do we have a concern in the thoracic area about uh, spinal cord artery violation, especially at the thoracal lumbar junction? That's an excellent question that always pops up. The infamous artery of Adam Kiewicz. Uh, so, yeah, so I usually approach these from the right side uh, because I'm going to put instrumentation in. And the artery of, of Adam, uh, if there is really that artery, some think that's a fallacy, but that's a left-sided uh, artery. So I'm, I always, my preference is to approach from the right side because I don't need to worry about the, the aorta uh, and the concern with my instrumentation. So no, that's not a concern for me. Bazem, uh, Patrick McNulty from Las Vegas again um, uh, identified the lateral extracavitary approach uh, as a very reasonable um, uh, thought. Uh, is that something that you in Germany with your MIS uh, techniques have uh, looked at? Uh, yeah, actually, we started to look for that a couple months ago with new instrumentations, uh, but this is something new for us, so we still try to figure out how this works for us.